Well, we're just here to continue the search for Madeline and to protect the, our own family and their human rights. And I think it's fairly clear, you know, no one should be allowed to say that our daughter cannot be found without very good evidence to the contrary. And that's what the, the court case is about. So the evidence that Madeline is dead. Jerry, that is what you heard yesterday. Is, you heard that, didn't you? This is just raking up old ground, isn't it, Jerry? No, no. Today, we are here. But the police... To, no, no, hang on, hang on. They're not raking up. This is a it's legal... Not what they have, 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 this is a legal process that we're going through to protect our daughter and our family. But there's nothing so, new being said by the police, yeah, Of course there? there's not. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. In the previous episode I said that we were going to follow up that episode with an episode on uh, Joanna Cipriano. Um, I'm not going to be doing that in this episode just because I want to continue just with the narrative in the previous episode which is just um, the, the whole ridiculous setting up of the abduction, paedophile abduction nonsense. And um, I just want to continue that conversation. And it's important to put the, put, you know, juxtapose this episode with that ep episode just in order to reinforce that. So I will get back to the um, Joanna Cipriano thing. But um, once I've concluded this whole debunking, now, I want you to pay attention to Jerry McCann's words, and I think this was in 2009, okay? So the McCanns were never um, charged with a crime, and they, went, they never went to court. They never stood trial for their crimes. But they nevertheless went to court quite, quite a lot, quite often, to um, attack others, to, you know, win settlements for defamation, slander, and uh, this is one instance of that. And what it sort of amounted to, and in, in Jerry's own words, is he says, I think it's very, fairly clear, you know, that no one should be allowed to say that our daughter cannot be found without very good evidence to the contrary. And that's what this court case is about. And so what Jerry is essentially saying is, we will say that our child is alive, and if anyone says our child isn't alive, we'll take you to court, and we will sue you for saying that our child isn't alive. And of course, the joke is um, the McCanns want people to prove that Madeline is dead, um, but it's like there's a bit of a disconnect where they say, well, they don't need to prove that she's alive. In other words, you must prove that she's dead, Otherwise, we'll sue you. Um, we don't need to prove that she's alive. And, um, you know, um, it's a little bit of a um, kind of a schizophrenic attitude. Um, you know, what we say is going to be gospel and we don't need evidence because we're the victims and uh, also the suspects um, at, at that time, of course. Um, and so anyone who um, opposes us, we will sue into silence. And so one of those uh, people was the lead detective, Amaral. Bear in mind the McCanns had written a book and um, made, you know, appeared in countless documentaries. And um, this was Amaral. Um, Amaral lost his job. Um, Jerry McCann didn't lose his job. So Jerry McCann was continuing to work as whatever he was doing and um, making, you know, appearances and fundraising and all sorts of things, whereas Amaral lost his job and his sort of only recourse was sort of to try to save his reputation, write a book, provide the, the you know, a version of events from his perspective. And then Jerry McCann was going to go off him as well, saying you will not write a book and we're going to take a book off the shelves and you must give us all the money from the book sales and, and you know, something around like... Um, uh, you know, maybe give us damages for damaging our reputation with your claims. And so episode seven is quite an interesting 
if again ridiculous um, version of the ongoing struggle of the McCanns to fight for justice for their daughter, the, the ongoing um, desperate search for Madeline years and years and years later, you know, just um, there's always hope and Madeline's still alive and all that kind of thing. And um, this episode uh, on this channel is going to provide some insight into exactly why this claim has been so laughable and also why the attempts to, um, you know, take people to court for saying anything opposing what they say is um, has been um, kind of an injustice um, perpetrated on others. And um, and a lot of people have suffered because of the McCanns. Um, Robert Murat, one of them. Um, Murat was someone who was helping the McCanns in the early days and then they turned him into a suspect. Um, so a lot of people, not just those directly associated with them, but the entire Pride Deluge, the, the tourism industry there suffered. The Ocean Club basically went bankrupt uh, because of the constant PR and negative publicity surrounding it. Um, this constant talk about pedophile abductors. Um, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs who were working for um, the, the Ocean Club. But I think the biggest um, victim in this whole story, aside from Madeline, is the lead detective. Who He was only doing his job and then he lost his job and uh, faced kind of a long pursuit and, um, you know, something, it was something that changed his entire life and arguably ruined his life. So I'm going to come back to these themes in a moment. Um, I just want to give you guys a heads up for what's coming soon on this channel. Um, first of all, there'll be the series Christopher Watts, What Else Do We Know, episode 10. Uh, I'm briefly going to deal with the trio of Rusek lawyers um, coming on very uh, timelessly, just before the Lifetime movie waving their hands, saying, um, we, we're so upset about all the publicity around this thing, uh, but they're going on TV to, to, to tell everyone how upset they are about the portrayal of the family. Um, I don't think they've even seen the movie, but they're really upset about it. And they're sort of, um, it's hard to say whether they're upset because they weren't approached and paid, or whether they're upset because there's coverage of the case. It's difficult to, to say which one it is. Are they upset because they're not getting a finger in the pie? Or are they upset because um, people are actually talking about true crime, um, as has been going on for decades? Um, this exceptionalism is actually quite sickening, um, and it's all sort of under the guise of sympathy for the Ruseks. Um, obviously, people have sympathy for the Ruseks, but... If the Rusex really didn't want publicity, just take your stuff off Facebook. Just take Chloe Shenan's Facebook profile. It's very easy to do. They've already changed the name of it. So just take it off, you know, shut down her social media and people will have less to look at and less to talk about. Very simple to do. So why don't they do it? So that's something I'm going to be talking a little bit about in um, the next um, uh, episode. And then... Um, There'll obviously be continuing coverage of the McCann's thing. I'm, I'm going to complete the series of debunking, but then I also want to go and do some additional um, background, just looking at um, prior deluge, uh, where could someone have hidden a body, um, what route did the abductor take potentially, um, kind of a closer look at the um, balcony where Madeline may have fallen off of, um, when I was in Pride Deluge, I um, stood right in front of it. I took photos of it through the foliage. So we're going to look at that. So if you're interested in that, please subscribe to the channel. Then um, on Patreon, um, I've got Christmas Star. It's um, nine chapters have already been uploaded on Patreon. Um, you can listen to the whole audio book for $5. I think the actual book costs more than that so you can get that kind of at a discount um, of course when um, when I've 
loaded net, uh, numerous audiobooks, you'll be able to listen to all of them for the same price, five dollars. Um, at this point, um, I'm one chapter away from completing the first, um, but I intend to put up uh, a couple of more books, especially the shorter books like Silver Fox and um, Murder Most Foul. Then uh, also on Patreon, I'm going to be doing a assessment of the Holly um, Dilly case, that little boy who fell down the chimney and, you know, what happened there. People can't understand how it happened, why it happened, what exactly happened. Um, I'm going to provide an assessment of that, um, which I think will sort of make sense um, of what of, of all the confusion. And that's also on Patreon. And then uh, something new coming to Patreon is um, I want to take you guys, the, the readers, the listeners, through the process of how... Um, I choose to write a book, why I choose to write a book, how the idea forms, how the narrative um, is written, how long it's written, what guides me in writing it, and just that whole process. I'm going to sort of be leading you uh, by the hand, sort of in real time, um, from the conceptual stage of a true crime narrative through to the end. And so what, what might be quite interesting for you is to follow the behind the scenes to read the book and then also even to get the audio version which will have the backstory as well and that'll give you a really um, uh, fly on the wall sort of aspect to true crime rocket science and uh, all of that's available on patreon uh, go to patreon slash tcrs okay and let's get started with today's episode so if you look at the um, image on screen at the moment, it's from a newspaper article saying, why did Maddie cops waste years on sighting of GP? And basically you're seeing an image of Tanner Man, which we covered in the previous episode, and then an image of Dr. Julian Totman. Um, a couple of things that I wasn't explicit about in that previous episode is, first of all, um, when they put the creepy buck tooth dude's face in the place of this tenor man in a, in a kind of an updated sketch, you've got to ask, do you think that Julian Totman and the buck tooth dude with a long moustache look the same? And the answer is they don't look anything the same besides the fact that they've got both got dark hair. Otherwise, they don't look the same whatsoever. So that's the first point to make. The second point to make is in the updated sketch, suddenly um, the new tenor man is walking instead of from left to right carrying a child, he's now walking from right to left, but not carrying a child. And so, but this time he's got a face. So now you lose the child and he's walking the wrong way, but now he's not carrying a child. So it's quite... Um, ludicrous really just the, the the you know just the sketches around this are absolutely crazy and of course the sketch that you want to pay attention to that was sort of withheld and and that's all smithman sighting which we'll get to in due course but i really meant to show this particular uh, headline during the previous episode I, to be honest i just couldn't find it um but but there it is so in this episode, you kind of have the McCann's investigator talking about how unfortunate and how really how unlucky the McCann's were in choosing the people for the investigations, just that everyone had really bad luck. Well, was it bad luck? Was it bad luck that, um, that they went after Tanner Man for five years? Was that bad luck or was that investigating a dead end and um, you know dead end that would go nowhere and that one could be confident and, and safe in the knowledge that would go nowhere because each time you've got to ask yourself if Madeline is dead and you're looking for someone as though she's alive then aren't you going to end up not finding anything anyway and if you're not going to find anything then what does one have to do does one have to manufacture leads 
For 18 months, no police agency anywhere had been actively searching for Madeline. To the McCanns, that was horrendous, and it was totally unacceptable. So what's quite fascinating in the voiceover you've just heard from Robin Swan is she talks about how for 18 months, um, no police agency anywhere had been actively searching for Madeline. And to the McCanns, that was horrendous and totally unacceptable. Really? Was it really so horrendous for the McCanns and was it so totally unacceptable? Because we know what was kind of going on. We know about the ludicrous search slash non-search for Tanner Man. Are you telling me the McCanns didn't know that Totman was actually Tanner Man? If they didn't know this, then, then you, you've got to sort of ask... How incredibly stupid could people be to search for four or five years for someone who had already come forward? How incredibly dumb could someone be? And when you've been given millions of pounds by the public, um, what an absolute waste of money that was to make such an incredibly pathetic mistake. And it's actually in this area of, of the Netflix documentary that you start getting a real sense of the sly trickery that's actually going on. Is when you look at the images, and this is where one's got to look at the producer of this and, and say, um, did the producer sort of put these images together and, and just didn't really think about it? Did the producer know where these images came from? Who provided these images and what were they trying to convey? And w w was what they were trying to convey a mistake? Or is something else going on that's actually a bit more nefarious? Which is, as I say, you've got images of Kate McCann looking through the window. And um, if you don't know this case very well, you wouldn't know that they on a um, billionaire's private jet and they're flying to see the Pope. As far as I recall, I could be wrong, but uh, uh, that's kind of the situation that's going on. And they're looking through the window, and the backstory that is being presented is, well, they're looking for Madeline. They're looking through the window for Madeline. No, they're not looking through the window for Madeline. They are um, heading to the Pope to shake his hand and to be seen by the world, to be blessed and in the favor of the Lord. That's kind of what it's all about. It's, it's to get the kind of public endorsement of the Pope and to, to, to seem innocent in the eyes of the world. That's what that's all about. It's not looking for Madeline. And yet the documentary is presenting this as a search for Madeline. But it gets even worse than that. In episode 7, you get a big spiel about the... Um, McCann's triumphantly riding into town almost like cowboys and you know they're going to come and set the Portuguese straight on their own turf and you've got the uh, British media there as well obviously as always pretty much sympathetic to the McCann's cause and then when all is said and done you get the little script um, on screen showing 2009 and it says a judge rules to ban further sales and publication of Goncalo Amaral's book and documentary, The Truth of the Lie. There it is in black and white. That's the, that's the result of, of all of this. It doesn't say that um, this is banned in Britain. Nor does it show any kind of headlines or news reports. It just shows this in sort of black and white. Then in a follow-up slide, almost immediately afterwards, you see one line of text, one, one sort of little line, and it says, a Portuguese court of appeal eventually overturns the ban. So 
Just think about how dishonest this is. I mean, if, if it's not dishonest, what is it? Is it um, misleading? Is it deceptive? Is it, um, you know, what, what, what's another way of describing this kind of thing? Is you, you make a very clear case for the case against Goncalo Amaral, right? You talk about the McCanns talking about him and, and all the criticism, right? And then you end off that chapter showing that the McCanns won their battle against him. Then in the final analysis, the McCanns lost their battle against him. Amaral won, but you don't provide any information on that. So the flip side of the story, you provide one little line of text with no context, no visuals, no information, no headlines, nothing. And so obviously in your episode, it's going to look like the McCanns fight for something and they win and they were right. And so if you keep emphasizing all the good things and all the positive aspects of a particular person and you minimize um, all the good things about somebody else, you're going to, you're going to move the, the bullshit bias arrow one way or the other. You're going to move that bullshit meter uh, away from one aspect and towards another. And this is a really good example just of how subtle uh, these documentaries are when they make these um, apologia. You present the sympathetic narrative to the one side and then you pretend to be um, you pretend to be uh, neutral and you pretend to be fair and you pretend to be providing the other side of the story. Only you give kind of one percent to the other side of the story. And I actually did a um, a, a check um, of this particular docu series, and I'll get to that in a in a different um, episode. But basically. I've, I went and I made a list of all the people participating in this docu-series. And I, I think it ran into 40, 50, 60 people. But I, I literally found all the names of every single person who appeared in this docu-series. And next to it, I wrote down whether this person was either explicitly with T. McCann uh, uh, potentially neutral or somewhat neutral, um, you know, sort of occupying the middle ground or where it wasn't clear on which side of the line they stood, and then which people were explicitly either critical of the McCanns or explicitly against the McCanns or explicitly suspicious of the McCanns or explicitly, let's say, on the side of Amaral. And I'm still going to um, reveal that bombshell but when you see that in, in, in sort of numbers, when you see the number of people that are Team McCann in this docuseries, it's actually it's unbelievable. It's actually unbelievable what um, uh, tribe people are expected to um, watch. And, and it's sort of fielded as um, investigative reporting that's not biased. And the amazing thing is um, the public are so easily duped by this that the public aren't uh, super informed about all the little details about the McCann case. So w when they fed all this information on a platter, they, they, they don't know how to think critically about it. And I know just before I went to Portugal, I spoke to a travel agent who wanted to know why I was going to Portugal, wanted to know why specifically Pride Deluge. And I told her, well, you know, go, go and, you know, do you have Netflix? I said, go and, go and watch that. And then she watched it. And then I pointed her to my, my blog and I said, you know, I've, I've done reviews and I've written books about this case. Um, and I said, let me know what you think. And I think when I came back from Portugal, I said, uh, you know, did you ever finish watching The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann? She said, yes. And I said, well, what did you think? And she said, no, I think it's clear that Madeleine's still alive and that she was abducted by a pedophile. And I said, you think that? She said, yes, no, I'm quite certain. I said, well, did you read any of my, my coverage or analysis? Yeah, I, I read a little bit. And I said, yeah, I can see what's going on here. You were just totally, um, you know, 
it, it's it's two doctors and other doctors and it's the slick documentary versus some idiot, some sort of local um, sort of schmo. Uh, who, what does he know? You know, what does he know? Obviously, the doctors and the slick documentary uh, have much better information than what you do, obviously. And, and that is what the general member of the public thinks. I think it's only um, some of the sort of more intelligent people and the people who know this case a little bit better that realize um, what uh, con artistry is kind of going on in the McCann case. It's actually really interesting when you when you think about the fact that ultimately um, the campaign to shut down Amaral and to sue him and to you know shut him down, get rid of his books, you know, it ultimately failed. And yet when you go back to that interview Jerry McCann gave, I think at the airport, you know, he's, he's coming into Portugal to, to take someone to court. And if you look at his demeanor, he doesn't look angry or upset or traumatized or victimized. He's kind of got a kind of a cocky bearing, not only in his face, but also in the way he speaks. And, you know, just what he says is he says, um, no one should be allowed to say that our daughter cannot be found. And you just look at the expression he has on his face. It's, it's, it's this is Jerry, um, uh, you know, kind of the gladiator. He's going to take on anybody who tells them that their daughter can't be found, that she's alive. So this is a guy, a doctor, who, who, who says the fact that there's no evidence proving that she's uh, not alive. Um, I, you know, I made that argument already, but he's kind of smiling and very assertive and very strong, but he ultimately lost this case. And how he lost it, I think it's the, it's the same grounds that I mentioned earlier, is by the same token that... that um, there's no evidence showing that Madeline is dead. Um, you can also say there's no evidence showing that she's alive. And I would argue that there is actually more evidence showing that she's not alive. And that is but it's insufficient evidence. It's incomplete evidence. And you can say the cadaver dog's barking sort of provides quite a few dots where you connect them and you say, well, you know what? It's strange. We haven't seen Madeline for 12 years and these cadaver dogs, which only alert to dead bodies, did alert and to blood. Uh, is there a connection between that and Madeline? No. Then you say, if there's not a connection between that and Madeline, what is the connection? And the answer is, I think, according to the McCann's question mark, it could be anything. Well, in which area do we have more evidence? In which area do we have more um reason to believe something and you know the law works is if somebody disappears for seven years the law classifies them as deceased and madeline's been gone for uh, almost twice that long and bear in mind for as long as madeline is alive and she's just disappeared um you are not really going to look at the parents you're not really going to say uh, you know maybe the parents did something as long as she's alive. As soon as Madeline's dead, then you're going to say, well, what happened to her? Like, she's, we've found her now. We're not looking for an abductor. She's dead. What happened? And you have exactly that scenario in the Nora Corrin case where uh, until Nora's remains were found, it was like, well, either Nora wandered off or um, maybe she was abducted. And so when her remains were found and, and no sign of an abduction, no sign of sexual assault, no sign of anything, then, of course, the, the abductor narrative completely falls away. And when the, the abductor narrative falls away, what are you left with? So in conclusion, um, you know, I named the... Uh, review of episode seven scams cons frauds and liars um, because in the penultimate episode of the netflix docuseries the pedophile theory goes into high gear we told that human trafficking is a 150 billion dollar a year industry 
and about pedophiles lurking in the dark web. Pedophiles are everywhere. Just as Madeleine could be anywhere and everywhere, she could be in Poland, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Argentina. You know, she could be anywhere. You know, um, in the same way, pedophiles could be everywhere as well. The pedophile theory is a handy one when you need a revolving door of potential suspects. It served the Ramses well over the past 20 years or more, and it's the grit, sorry, it's the gift that keeps giving in terms of new suspects in the endless search for Madeleine McCann. At the end of episode 7, the McCann's PR dude holds up the latest ped, uh, pedophile of the moment, an Australian woman and the mainstream media go nuts. Maybe Madeleine is in Australia. And so, just as required, the Belfast Telegraph um, puts up a headline, Search for Madeleine McCann focuses on Australia. That's August 2009. Instantly, the previous suspect, whether the bucktooth creeper or tanner man, is forgotten completely as the narrative hops from one handy pedophile to the next. While a distracted audience not paying attention to the McCann case might be jarred back into it, intermittently with a sense of, oh, they found another suspect. The investigation hasn't been fruitless. A more consistent approach exposes the investigation into Madeline's disappearance as an ongoing circus act. If Madeline's not dead, the public need to be reminded periodically that she's out there and to do that, um, to do that the show must go on. More and more circus acts are needed and with them circus ringmasters and circus performers. If the McCanns in the top of seven have been very effective over the years at PR, at prosecuting and at suing and silencing their critics, they've been staggeringly ineffective at investigating their daughter's case. In the apology published below, which coincided with another massive payout from the Sunday Times, it doesn't take a genius to figure out the McCanns appear to be a little on the slow side in making information available. The Smith men efforts came out sometime in 2008, but were only handed over to the cops in late 2009. Bear that in mind when you talk about the whole 18 months that were going by and the McCann's thought this was horrendous. The Metropolitan Police only received them two years after that, so in 2011. Not exactly a picture of urgency or efficiency, is it? And this is an article from The Guardian. Jerry McCann attacks disgraceful Sunday Times after £55,000 libel payout, October 2014. The articles dated October 27th, Madeline clues hidden for five years and investigators had EFITs five years ago. We referred to EFITs which were included in a report prepared for private investigators for the McCanns and the fund in 2008. We accept that the articles may have been understood to suggest that the McCanns had withheld information from the authorities. This was not the case. We now understand and accept that the efforts had been provided to the Portuguese and Leicestershire police by October 2009. Bear in mind, October 2009 is two years after Tanner Man, and Tanner Man still needed three years to run its course. Remember. So why isn't Smithman and these efforts, why didn't this Trump Tanner man in October 2009 when they were provided to the police? Why didn't the police do anything about it? Why didn't somebody insist that something be done about it? We uh, uh, Part of this apology um, provided by the Sunday Times says, we also understand that a copy of the final report, including the efforts, was passed to the Metropolitan Police in August 2011, shortly after it commenced its review. When you look at the people the McCanns seem to handpick for the job of looking for Madeline, um, money wasn't a limiting factor. The public had handed over millions to be spent on the search, and yet which investigators did these clever doctors choose to spend this easy money on? I'm not going to spend too much um, 
more time uh, on this particular episode. Uh, but of course, right at the end of the episode, you have yet another cliffhanger. Um, at the same time that the docuseries announces a new suspect resembling Victoria Beckham uh, in, in a sort of cliffhanger to lead into the finale, um, the series remembers an incidental but possibly game-changing piece of evidence. A witness in the apartment above saw someone leaving the area below, which is outside 5A. Carol Tanmer saw a man acting rather strangely as he closed the gate at 5A. And this is why an exhaustive timeline set out in the beginning made sense, not at the end. Not, not um, two years later or, th or five years later, someone remembered something. You established this information that was established right in the beginning, at the beginning of your story. And what I love about the, the way the, the docuseries presents this is they're trying to present this person that is entering the McCann's home as some kind of stranger. He's sort of just familiarly coming in and leave, coming and going. and But they're saying, no, 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 it, it probably wasn't one of the top of seven. It was, it was, it was who knows, this is yet another uh, potential abductor. Who is it more likely to be? Um, if, if you had a group of doctors holidaying together and living literally side by side in a, in a holiday complex, literally one apartment next to another, next to another, next to another, another one above, um, who is likely to visit one another when they're playing tennis with one another, eating with one another than the top of seven? Why, why wouldn't they be visiting each other? Why wouldn't, they, why wouldn't a neighbor on holiday with another neighbor um, you know, that are holidaying together, why wouldn't they go, go to see one another? They're doing things together. Their children are together. Why wouldn't they do things together? No, 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 no. It's far more likely that this person that was seen is someone who wasn't even staying at the hotel. In episode 7, we also not provided with a conceivable clear route an abductor might have taken if he headed from the Ocean Club to the Smithman sighting. It's simply not depicted. No timeline is provided for how long it might take to carry a child from 5A to the location of the Smithman sighting either. There's also no attempt to integrate the time of the Smithman sighting in any detail. Smith, since the Smith family ate at a nearby restaurant that night and received a time-stamped receipt, this detail shouldn't have been too, dif too difficult. Specific information such as the apartment number the McCanns moved to inside the Ocean Club after the incident for the first two months is also left out. It was G5A, the apartment in the same block, very close to Doc, Dr. Julian Totman, a.k.a. Tannerman, former apartment, uh, his former apartment, and in fact right beside G4M. And that concludes today's episode. Um, the next episode will cover the final episode in the series and from then on I will do a little bit of background uh, in, in terms of the, Ju, um, the Joanna Cipriano case and some of the topographical aspects. Um, I'll go into that. Um, so if you're interested in the McCann case, subscribe to this channel. Uh, and if you're interested in the John Bonet case, uh, there's content on Patreon, so head to that for that. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys next time.